Larry's word is exactly right on. So I just want to say thank you, Larry, for sharing that. That's, that's uh, very, very powerful, very accurate, very, very anointed. So thank you, Larry, for sharing that. So anyway, I, I do want to start out just, just the, the title of this message is The Urgent Need for Readiness. We're, I'm just going to pause just for uh, this Sunday from that series we've been in on the New Testament church and uh, just speak about what the Lord has placed on my heart and what Larry said, God is bringing the fire and we need to realize that we need not to run from the fire because the challenge will be we want to run. And uh, you might accuse me of pastoral manipulation, but I had them sing that Refiner's Fire song and all of you were singing, Lord, purify my heart. So you're set up for this message. So maybe that's pastoral manipulation. I'm kidding. I'm, hopefully it's not. But I just want to bring what I believe is the word of the Lord to us. There's different times when God will put on teachings or emphasis or whatever that we teach from Scripture. And there's other times when the Lord will speak, what is the Spirit presently saying to the church, this church? And I believe this is one of those messages of what the Lord is speaking to this church in the hour we live in right now. And so if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Malachi chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 1. We'll read Malachi 3 verse 1. And this prophecy has both a partial fulfillment at the first coming of Jesus through John the Baptist. And it also has an end time fulfillment at the, at the end of the age through a a company, I believe, of messengers that God is going to raise up to prepare the way of the Lord. But starting in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, the Lord prophesies, and he says through Malachi, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, that in the first coming applied to John the Baptist, and the second coming, I believe, applies to Elijah and all that it entails of an Elijah army, of, of a company of messengers that God's raising up a John the Baptist type vessel, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The coming of the Lord is a sudden thing. In fact, Jesus said that if you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly like a thief. And so the Lord's coming, his second coming is suddenly, it's going to come unexpectedly to those who are not awake. Like the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking. They were car uh, carrying out in their normal activities of life until God's coming of his judgment broke in and no one understood until the flood came and took them away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. He's coming suddenly. He's coming suddenly. He's coming suddenly. And the messenger of the covenant, talking about the Lord, That's, this is talking about the Lord, in whom you delight, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now this is where we get to verse 2, and especially what Larry said, but who can endure the day of his coming? Because when the Lord comes, he's coming like a fire, and the temptation that we all have is to run from the fire because when the fire comes, ugly things in our lives begin to surface because God is raising up the impurities and the temptation is to be like, I'm getting out of this place. It's too hot. The heat is too hot. Well, you've been praying for God to make you ready for the last six years. And now he's coming to answer by fire and circumstances and difficult situations. Are you going to get up and run now when the fire gets hot? Who can endure the day of the Lord's coming? We've got to realize, listen, we are living at the end of the age. There is absolutely no doubt that we are living at the end of the age. I'm not predicting a time when the Lord's coming. I have no idea. I, I just can look at the scriptures and I can look at what's unfolding in current events and I can say everything, everything is in perfect alignment. And the warning of the Lord in scriptures, who can endure this day? 
it's going to get intense. As everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Now, the Lord doesn't say these things to scare us, but to prepare us. Sometimes when people hear these things about the end of the age, they get scared and frightened. And the Lord's like, I'm not saying these things to scare you. I'm saying these things to prepare you. And so we can't just put our head in the sand and just say, I'm going to ignore this and not allow the heat of his fire as he comes to purify, to embrace it. The prophet says, who can endure this day? It's like what Larry said, don't run from the fire. This fire that's coming and is even here is the answer to the prayers you prayed in your prayer closet. Crying out, Lord, make me to be ready as your bride. And it comes in a way you didn't expect, in a way you didn't like, and you're like, I'm out of here. It's too hot. It's too intense. His coming uh, is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller soap. Now, the Lord's coming is not just a one-time event in the, when he parts the clouds in, in the sky with great power and glory. As all the nations see him and mourn over him, as the scriptures talk about, his coming is actually a complex series of events. It's a, it's a process. It's a season that unfolds. And that entire time frame of his coming and even the days that precede the, what would be known as the coming of the Lord and the day of the Lord, even those days that precede it, God is raising up messengers like John the Baptist with the spirit and the power of Elijah. God is raising up these messengers who are clearing the way before them and he puts an anointing on these messengers who have this, the spirit of God coming and releasing even the fire, the refiner's fire of the Lord. When Sam Sullivan was here a couple months ago, I believe he released something. <laughs> he certainly released their, I'm, I'm kidding if he listens to this, but something cer certainly was released in my basement. <laughs> I mean, good gosh. <clears throat> the sewage thing broke, and then we've had mice, and then I lost my man card on Friday. I walked down, put the uh, uh, lawnmower up. I walked into my, my, my basement. I said garage, basement. I walked into my basement, and I, I'm, you know, just casual looking over, and I look over in the, the corner of my basement, and there's like a four-foot rat snake in my basement. And I am like, I mean, I lost my man card. I, I don't know if I screamed. Anna says I didn't scream. I think I screamed. I felt jittery and shaken. I'm like, what do I do? I'm not going to touch that thing. So, you know, you're, you're stuck with this thing, and the snake's in your basement. It could get into the finished basement, possibly into the house. And so I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? And so first thing was to do is to call John. I, he's the, probably the, the most snake-friendly, loving brother I have that's close. So I call him. He's on a work call, so I can't get into him. And so Angie says, hey, why don't you contact our next-door neighbor? His name's Conway. And so I because Conway had told me that he doesn't mind snakes another time when I saw a snake and scream. And so Conway comes over, and his uh, daughter comes over, and his daughter loves snakes. So I'm like, hey, this is great. This is awesome. She came over excited. And so anyway, it, you know, we, we, get into my, we get into my basement, and they're looking for the snake, and the snake's gone. And then Conway, he's not good with names, so he calls me. He says, hey, Tom, you know, where, where should we look? And I'm like, Tom? So anyway, if you want to be a no-name pastor, I have, you know, I've been called Brother Bill and now Tom. So I don't know where he got Tom from. Which is fine because sometimes I call him Conrad, so I'm not giving names, he's not giving names, so it was a good even deal there. But anyway, I look up and this snake is now gone. I'm like, oh Lord, this is going to be, there's no way we'll be able to even rest if we don't. So they start going in the unfinished basement, I mean the finished basement, they start looking around and they can't find it. And then I'm like, I'm like, oh God, what do we do? And so anyway, I look over and the snake is coming out of a, it, he, had, he, had crawled, he had slithered up into the garage. We have like a garage door in our basement. He slithered, slithered up into the garage door and was dangling about this much out of the hole. And I was like, oh, there he is, there he is. And, you know, and my man card's lost. The, the, the brave girl goes up and, you know, she's like, takes it with the rake, gets it off. And I'm just going, oh, man, give me the heebie-jeebies. But I don't know where, I don't know even where I was going with all that. But... <laughs> 
my basement, Sam Sullivan, is an example of a fiery messenger who released something in us. I have to give him a hard time next time I see him, but released something when he was here that has surfaced things in all of our hearts. It was a release of the Lord through his ministry that has brought us into a season where God's refining fire has come and he's, he's bringing out the poop out of our lives because we've been stuck in my basement kind of almost being like a sign. I feel like my basement's become the prophetic sign. I can't wait till it's a sign of restoration because I'm ready to get over all this stuff. We've had mice and we got basically like a safari. We've got mice and cockroaches and snakes and it's like all these bugs, a skink. And I'm like, God, okay. Anyway, we could do a safari, but I'm like going, okay, Lord, what is this you're trying to do in my basement? And, you know, it's like, God, it's like the, the, the stuff is coming up. The poop is coming up to the surface. Okay. God is wanting to come like a refiner's fire and like fuller soap. And he's wanting to bring up the impurities in our lives and our hearts so that we would be pure and we would be holy and we would be blameless before the Lord and his second coming. Because God is raising up a bride. God is raising up uh, mature sons of God. God is raising up at the harvest at the end of the age a maturing of the, the children of God into Christ-like sons. This is your destiny. And he is raising up a worthy bride who is like the Lord in nature and in character, who's living by his indwelling life and has become like the Lamb in all things. And for God to have this, he comes like a refiner's fire and like fuller soap. And he sits to smelt and purify the silver. He purifies the sons of Levi, the priesthood, and refines them like gold and silver so they may present to the offerings, to the Lord, offerings in righteousness. This is about the priesthood. This is about purifying the priesthood. The priesthood that's going to minister to the Lord for all of eternity as the bridal priest, the priestly bride whose garments have been washed clean by the fuller soap, a thorough, deep cleansing of everything, sin, selfishness, and defilement, so that we might stand before him and worship him before the throne of God in the holy of holies forever and ever and ever, gazing on the beauty of the Lord, gazing on the Lord who sits on the throne, who the angels cry out, holy, 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 and they never get bored. The beauty of his majesty we will forever gaze upon. God is preparing you to be that priestly bride before the throne on Mount Zion for the endless ages of eternity. But we cannot come in to the presence of God in our condition and in our state. We must be purified. We must have the fire of God come and burn and surface and raise up within us those things that are not like him. You sing it, all right? I'm bringing it. Just kidding, but not really. Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can endure his second coming? The Holy Spirit is coming with a baptism of fire. Now, we, say, we think that's, that in, one, in some ways that's great. In some ways, the baptism of fire also means he's coming to purify and raise up and raise up those impurities and that gold to bring about pure gold, holiness and purity. He's bringing up those things to the surface. If you feel like things are coming to the surface right now, you're in a good place. Just don't run from it. Winston Churchill said, if you're going through hell, keep on going. If you're going through hell, keep on going. If you're going through a difficult time, if you're going through a challenging time, keep on going. Don't stop. Don't quit. Don't run. Don't say, I'm getting out of here. God's doing a work in you. God's doing a work in you. Don't run from what the, th the very thing that is being answered in this season when you prayed for it in your prayer closet when no one saw but God. Now he's bringing it in the season. You cried out for it. It's manifesting and coming. Don't run from the very fire he's bringing. Let it surface up in you those things that need to be repented of.
We are living right now in a unique time in history, a time I've never seen anything like, like what we're witnessing. And I'm talking about judgment begins in the house of God. And Peter talked about that, 1 Peter 4.17. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? What Peter's saying here is that God comes to the church first in judgment before he comes to the world in judgment. Now, God's judgment to the church is very different than God's judgment that's going to be released in the nations. We've lost the message of the Lord's judgment in our seeker-friendly, seeker-sensitive churches that does, cannot stomach the topic of the judgments of God. But Jesus is a judge. And Jesus has arisen... In this time as judge to bring judgment to his house. I've never seen anything like this in my 30 plus years of following Christ. Over the past four years, the level of exposure God is bringing to the global church. Just think about what we've seen. Hillsong Church exposed. Brian Houston, exposed. Carl Lentz, exposed. Robbie Zacharias, exposed. Mike Bickle, exposed. The Southern Baptist Convention, exposed. Robert Morris, the, mega, the, the leader of the largest church in America, exposed. T.D. Jakes, exposed. Tony Evans, exposed. Mike Pilavachi in the, uh, the UK, exposed. Uh, and I, I could just list so many other things of exposure that's coming into the house of God, showing the, the true nature of what's coming. We are living in the hour of God's judgment. God is cleansing his house. God is coming to purify his people. God is coming to purify his bride. I've never seen anything quite like it. It's almost like you, you get on Twitter and you're like, what's going to happen next? Who's the next person that's going to be exposed? And you almost develop this attitude of like, do I trust anyone? I mean, who do you even trust? You know, who's coming next? What's the next thing God's going to expose? This tells me, I mean, this is a move of God. Just as much as the Toronto blessing or the Brownsville revival or whatever move of God we've said, the first great awakening, the second great awakening, this judgment and exposure is the move of God. He's coming. He's arising as judge, as the lion. See, we got to remember, we got to learn the lesson of the first century Jewish people. They were expecting a conquering Messiah, they were expecting him to come and defeat Rome and to establish the prophecies of Isaiah. Yet they failed to re realize Isaiah 53, that he's first coming as a lamb to suffer for the atonement of our sins. Now it's reversed, and most Christians have no paradigm of Jesus being the lion. They only view him as the lamb. Yet he's coming as a lion. He's coming in judgment. He's coming in war. He's coming to purify his church. And if we don't have this, this right paradigm, like the first century Jews, we can miss him. He's coming to take over. He's coming to take over in his house. He's coming to take over in his church. Now, here's what I want to say to us. If God is moving in this way in this nation and in the nations, but especially right now in this nation, how arrogant would it be for us just to look at them and go, oh, those wicked, evil people that God's bringing judgment on, they're wicked wolves in sheep's clothing, whatever, and not look at our own selves and realize, no, God is also coming to this house in judgment. I mean, if God's bringing the spirit of, of uh, burning and the spirit of judgment into his church, he is bringing that 
also to this church. Let's never think in a self-righteous way, oh, look at them and point the finger. No, God is moving in this way without respect for any person. He's coming to get what he wants. I had a, 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 an encounter in April, on April 4th, 2004, so many years ago. I think this, no, 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 April 4th, I can't even remember. It was April 4th. I think it was before I was even married, so it wasn't 2004. April 4th, 2000, April 4th, whatever year it was, and I woke up straight out of sleep. I mean, just like woke up wide awake, and I immediately heard, I looked at the clock, and it was 4.44 a.m., and I immediately heard at that moment, Isaiah 4.4 is what I'm about to do in the church. I mean, just like woke up straight out of a dead sleep, and I looked at 444, and the Lord said, I am, I am bringing Isaiah 4-4 to the church. That is the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. God is bringing the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning to his house, to this house, to me, to you, to us. God's bringing the spirit of burning and the spirit of judgment because he is jealous for you. This is not because he's mad at you. It's because he's jealous for you. It's not because he's, you know, mad. You know, maybe in some ways he could be with some, but I don't, I don't know for sure. But he's doing this out of a jealous love. He's doing this out of motivated by his jealous love for you. And he wants to purify you for himself. So we are... I just want us to know this. I am not exempt from this season of judgment that's coming to his church globally. You are not exempt from this season of judgment that God is bringing to his house globally. We, as Restoration Life, are not exempt from the judgment God is bringing into his house. That, that we are not exempt from that. God is doing this work in us. All right. Anyone... Ready to leave yet? Ready for lunch? <laughs> so as I, I had a lot of difficulty preparing this message. Okay, Lord, there's a lot of different thoughts that I had preparing for this message. And I know there's different people. They're in different places. I know that some of the things I'm going to share are not for every one of us. I know that some of the things are are for all of us. Some of the things are for certain individuals and things like that. So that's why I said, Lord, I, make sure you take some time to ask the Lord to speak to you. Hear God's voice speak to you. Not, if he uses me, that's awesome, but to you. Okay, what is God speaking to you in this? Does that make sense? Okay, so just, just want to walk through some things the Lord put on my heart as I prayed. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is that some... This, this would be like a, like a small number. I don't even know who or I don't know how many, but I think a, a small number are in this valley of decision. They're in a valley of decision. It's Joel 3.14. Multitudes, multitudes are in the valley of decision. The day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Some people need to make a very decisive, firm call and devotion that I am going to follow Jesus Christ no matter the cost. It's like in the days of Elijah when Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal and he said, if God is God, follow him. This is like an Elijah moment for some where he's calling you into the valley of decision and he's saying, are you going to follow Baal or are you going to follow Christ? Are you going to follow yourself or are you going to follow the Lord? Who is it you're going to follow right now? Because if you're not going to follow Christ, then go ahead and turn and follow. You go your own way. That's kind of where the Lord brings us in certain times and seasons where he wants a decisive call for us to say, who is it you're going to follow? Again, this is not for everyone here. This is for some, a few. In, in a very sobering scripture, it's Revelation 22, verse 10 and 11. The Lord put this on me in prayer. And I hope you can hear what God is speaking in Revelation 22, 
10 through 11. John has an encounter with an angel, and the angel tells him, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. It's very different than what the Lord spoke to Daniel. Seal up the words of the prophecies of this book because the time is yet to come. Now the angel says, don't seal it up because now this is unfolding right before us, even though there's been a delay. Now listen to what the angel told John. He said, let the one who does wrong still do wrong. Why? Why would God say such a thing? Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. Let the one who is filthy still be filthy. Why would a God who wants us to be pure and holy, why would he say those things? What? That doesn't even make sense. Wouldn't he want us to repent? Let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness. Let the one who is holy still keep himself holy. What does this mean? This is like, Lord, what are you saying in this? Why would you say still practice unrighteousness, still remain in sin and not repent. Lord, what is it you're saying? I believe this, this statement emphasizes the fixed state of human character at the time of Christ's return. There are moments in time when the decisions we make become irreversible. Let me say that again, because this is a word for some. There are moments in time when the decisions we make become irreversible. We only get so many second chances before our responses and decisions become solidified. That is sobering. Why not have our responses and decisions be solidified on the journey and the road to readiness rather than living for our own sin and selfishness, living for our own self. I was so blessed that uh, hearing that dad, the Lord gave the dad a word last Sunday that, that God is a God of second chances. Because when we were doing Sean and Julia's wedding, that was the, the same word the Lord had given me was that, that God is a God of restoration. God is a God of second chances. God is a God of second chances. And, and that just demonstrates the awesome, kind heart of God. And, and I just have seen just God giving certain people second chances, and he's pouring out favor on them, and he's pouring out his kindness on them, and he's showing his love towards them. And I'm just sitting back going, Lord, that is so beautiful. That is so awesome how you're drawing them back with a second chance and giving them a second chance to recover what they had lost. And I do believe, I, I so witnessed with what Dad said was confirmation of what I said. I do believe that last Sunday's word is a word for some of us, many of us. I don't even know how many. That God is a God of second chances. He's a God of second chances. Okay, and I don't mean to be the Debbie Downer here, but God's kindness in giving us second chances is to lead us to repentance. He doesn't give us a second chance so that we can continue living our own selfish ways that got us into the position for which we needed the second chance. You see what I'm saying? If God in his kindness has so given you a second chance, he's not calling you to go back to living the way you were that got you into that position that needed the second chance. He's calling you, his kindness is calling you to repentance, to be the man or the woman of God he's called you to be. To be the one in your marriage, in your family that rises up and says, this is God's divine order in this house. That I, as the leader of this house, that God has appointed you as the husband, I'm going to rise up as the divine authority, not in a Middle Eastern like weird way where you take an abusive way, I don't mean that. But you're rising up in the authority God's given you to be the servant of Christ in your house, to love God your wife, like Christ loves the church, and to be that priest of your house that's, that's seeking the voice of God. What is God saying for our family? Divine order in your marriage. 
It's vital. Divine order in your marriage is vital. Divine order in your marriage is vital. <clears throat> I just believe, and I, I felt like when I was praying about this message, I felt like the Lord said, I want to speak some unpremeditated things through you today. Normally, if you notice, what I preach and what I do in my notes are almost exactly the same. But I felt like the Lord said, not today. You need to wait on me and pause in certain minutes to what I'm going to speak. <clears throat> but I believe that the Lord is saying to some men in this fellowship that you must have divine order in your marriage and it starts with you as a man of God. It starts with you becoming a godly man. It starts with you going into the holy of holies in God's presence. It starts with you getting the word of the Lord for your family and the direction of the Lord in your family and, and, and being the spiritual leader that you need to be of Christ himself rising up within you. To be the man of God and not just to say, okay, she's going to lead in spiritual things. No, you are called to be the man of God. You're called to be the leader in your house. You're called, to be, you're called to love your wife like Christ loves the church. You're called to be the one that senses the voice of God and has a relationship with God, not just her. Let's be the man of God we need to be, all right? Let's be the man of God, the men of God we need to be in our marriages because the church desperately needs a church and marriages and families that are in divine order. So what John is saying here is there, come, there's, there comes moments in time, moments in history where the decisions we make and the responses we make, whether for righteousness or selfishness and sin, are cemented, solidified, and they become irreversible. That's sobering. But it's also encouraging because if we've made that decision to say, I want to be on the road to readiness, I want to be on the road to purity and to righteousness, then God will see to it that that's solidified in our lives. Why not be that kind of person that says the one who does righteous is still going to do righteous? The one who is holy is still going to be holy. There comes a moment in time when those choices are no longer available. Now, we know God is a God of restoration. We know God is a God of second chances. Praise God for that. I, I just, God, where would we be if we, he wasn't that way? But listen, there is no guarantee. There is no guarantee that he will come and give you a second chance or a third chance or a fourth chance. Even though that's part of his nature, Sin and selfishness can so harden us to the point where we can no longer respond and we can no longer turn back to him. Even though God and by the spirit of God would draw us and woo us, we become so hardened in our condition that our, our condition has been solidified because we spurned the invitation of God to respond to him when he was wooing us and drawing us. That's sobering. But I believe it's scriptural. Today is a day of salvation, not tomorrow. Today is a day to get ready, not tomorrow, because the Lord is coming like a thief. The Lord is coming like a thief. He's coming like a thief in the night. The Lord spoke that to the church of Sardis. And he said, he said, if you do not wake up, and the church of Sardis was in slumber, they were in apathy. And the Lord said to them, if you, if you do not wake up, if you do not repent, if you do not do what you've heard, then I'm going to come like a thief and you will not know the day or the hour I come upon you. Leonard Ravenhill said, the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. 
in the season of God's gracious invitation to us, of Him giving us a second chance, that sees there is an expiration date on that season. And if we don't start the path and the journey into what He's wanting us to be and do and to be wholehearted for God, that expiration date can hit and we can miss the gracious invitation of God, and we can be fixed in our unrighteous, unholy character for all eternity. And then we can become identified by our sinful life rather than by Christ. It's a sobering thing. It's a sobering thing. I am coming like a thief. Now, the Lord spoke that many times in an end time context to say, my return, my coming, the season of my coming is going to be an unexpected coming. It's going to be like a thief in the night. It's going to be like a snake in the basement <laughs> where you look up and boom, you're startled and unexpected. He's come. Something's happened. He's unleashed. The very thing Scripture has talked about, the very prophetic word has been unleashed and there's no escaping in the unfolding of his prophetic events. The Lord warns the church of Sardis, but he warns them not from an end time perspective, but from a, temp, from a judgment perspective of that local church. The Lord coming like a thief to Sardis was a warning to this local church, I'm coming to you in judgment upon the individuals who do not wake up. This one probably applies to a lot of us. We, many of us, are living as if we're not living at the end of the age. <laughs> it's one thing for the world to be characterized as eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, but it's a whole other thing for the church to be swept into that very same characteristic or description. God help us if it's us where the cares of life quench out the word of the Lord. And he comes like a thief unexpectedly, suddenly, and we suffer the consequences for our lack of repentance and responding appropriately to what the Lord has said. If you look at the, the parable in Luke 14 where the Lord invited people to the marriage, marriage supper of the Lamb. And they all begin to make excuses. Well, I've just got married. I've got to go see my wife. i just got a business. I've got to go attend to my business. I just did this. I need to do this. And they were all legitimate things, responsibilities we must take care of and just in the stewardship God has given us. But the lack of response to the invitation of the Lord to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb and to adequately prepare ourselves because it takes a lifetime. Now, if you're older and you haven't responded quite like you should have, the Lord said the first shall be last, the last shall be first. God can make up to you the years that the locusts have eaten, so don't get under discouragement. But what I'm saying is that the cares of life can come in. This is probably a, a real warning for us because there's so many responsibilities and so much we have to do and attend to in the culture that we live in to take care of our house, to take care of our family. All those are legitimate responsibilities that we must do and to do and f do our jobs, do our work, and all those different things. But the driving purpose, the vow that we must take to the Lord is we say, God, I am going to do whatever I need to do to make myself ready for you. I have one life to live, and that life goes by very quick. It goes by in the twinkle of an eye. It goes by in, in just like a, a breath. It goes by in one millisecond. 
And yet we spend all of our time on that little tiny bit of life we have called the 70 to 80, I'll just say 120 years God gives us in this life. We spend all of our energy and time focused on these little tiny things that are is really that big when eternity goes endlessly that way forever and ever and ever. And we spend so little time focusing on eternity and getting ready for eternity and getting ready for the Lord and the second coming of Christ. And we put all of our energy into the cares of life. It doesn't mean you can't enjoy life. It doesn't mean you can't have fun. It doesn't mean you can't do things go on vacation. That doesn't mean any of that. It, what it means is like your focus, your vision, your pursuit. What are you living for? Are you living for pleasure? Or are you living for Christ? Now, don't get me wrong. Living for Christ will bring you incredible pleasure. God is not going to bring you into a relationship with him and make you miserable. Like dad talked about last Sunday, it's like some people have this idea that living for Christ and living in a relationship with Christ is boring and, you know, dull and just miserable for the rest of your life. No, absolutely not. Yes, it's challenging. Yes, God does challenge us to deal with things in our lives. But the overall emphasis of this is the relationship is incredible. It's in your presence, it's fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. God did not save you to make you miserable. God saved you to give you endless joy in him, in your relationship with him. God's coming like a thief. Jesus is coming like a thief. I believe that applies to this some in this local church who have heard the message and have not repented and said, Lord, I... Now listen, when I say repent, I don't mean just make a, a come up to the altar and say, yes, I agree with you. I'm talking about bearing fruit with, in your repentance. I'm talking about faith without works is dead. I'm not talking about lip service where you say, yes, I agree, and I'm coming up, and I'm going to come up to the altar, and I'm going to say a prayer, and I'm going to do all these things, and you go off and you live the very same way you lived before you came up. That's pointless. That's a waste of energy getting up from where you are to right here. It's pointless. God wants us to bear fruit in our repentance. God wants us to uh, produce the works of true faith. Faith without works is dead. If you say you believe, but you don't practice what you believe, you really don't believe. Faith without works is dead. How are you going to demonstrate your response to the word of the Lord and the changes you're going to make in how you live before him? I believe as well that not only does this apply to the Lord's judgment coming to those individuals who do who have heard the message and have not responded and remain spiritually in slumber and apathetic, but I also believe this, is we're about to experience another birth pain. A major birth pain is coming. I do not know what. I do not know when. I just have this sensing in my, in my spirit. It's one of those things where you just sense this, this inward knowing that a, that a major birth pain is coming. I don't know when, I don't know what. And for those who are not ready for that shaking that's coming, it could bring devastating consequences to you. Now, I'm not saying that to scare you, but to prepare you. I'm not saying that, I'm saying that so we'll, we'll wake up right now and pursue the Lord wholeheartedly in our relationship with him. The Lord's very, very clear to the, to the church at Philadelphia. If you overcome, I will protect you from the hour of trial that's coming. That protection is not for every single one of his children. That protection is not for every single person who's justified and has faith in Jesus Christ and is going to heaven and is a child of God. That protection in context is given to the one who overcomes. To the one who overcomes, to the one who pursues readiness, and the one who is on that path of readiness, to that one, I'm quoting the Church of Philadelphia, to that one I will protect you, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's coming upon the face of the earth. The trials that's coming to America, God will protect you 
If you're pursuing him wholeheartedly in readiness, listening to his voice, making yourself ready, repenting where you need to repent, being the man or woman of God you need to be. All right, there's still two more points. You want me to quit yet? <laughs> okay, there's, for those that I haven't hit yet, this, these, these next ones will probably hit you. We have to beware of elitism and self-righteousness if we've made the decision to make ourselves ready. If we've been on this path to say, I'm going to live an overcoming life. I'm going to live in readiness. I'm going to make myself ready for the Lord. And we've devoted ourselves to the Lord and we've pursued him wholeheartedly. The warning that we have to watch out for is that we would develop an attitude of elitism, what some have called bride pride. The idea being that I and this other tiny little remnant, only we are the bride of Christ. And it develops what is called bride pride, where you think, okay, me and these other little tiny group of people, only us are the faithful remnant of the bride. It's kind of like the Elijah syndrome, where Elijah, in his self-righteousness, was like, Lord, I alone am left, and they're seeking to kill me. And the Lord's like, no, there's actually 7,000 people who I've preserved that you don't even know about. So we've got to be very careful that, that we don't allow elitism or self-righteousness to get into our heart to where we say, okay, I'm on this road to readiness, and we begin to criticize those who may not be, have taken those steps on the journey. Pray for them. Don't criticize them. Intercede for them, not out of a, a judgmental heart. Pray for them that, that God would get them on that road to overcoming. Humility is the foundation of readiness. Humility is the foundation of readiness. I remember, I don't know, 10, 10 plus years ago, I had a conversation with a lady and she told me, I'm an overcomer. Like talking about, not, not quoting Romans chapter 8, we're all overcomers in Christ, but quoting Revelation 2 and 3. I'm an overcomer, you know, I've overcome everything, basically. And I looked at her and I'm like thinking to myself, no, you're actually not. <laughs> I don't even know if you've even started on the journey. But she had this pride in her where she thought, because she went to a church that talked about readiness and she went to a church that spoke about overcoming, that's that she was an overcomer and she was making herself ready. But what happened is pride got in instead of humility and that pride actually disqualified her from being ready. Humility is the foundation of readiness. You're marrying the, the humble and meek lamb, not the proud and arrogant independent dragon. <laughs> he's humble. He's meek. He's gentle. We must be that way as well if we're going to be married to him. God must do that work in us of sanctification and transformation. See, we've got to realize that anything God does in us is because of his grace and his grace alone. God moved, and he moved on your heart, and you responded and said yes. God moved and did an internal transformation in your heart. God moved and filled you with the Spirit. Yes, you responded, but whatever God has done is because of his grace alone, not because of your personal merit and how good you are and how much you pray and how much you fast and how much of the Bible you know. See, this can creep in very, very subtly. Elitism. Pride. We think I'm superior to these other people because I have this secret knowledge that God's given me by revelation of what it means to be made ready, and I'm pursuing this, and the rest of the church is not pursuing it like I am pursuing it. 
Beware that your readiness does not make you feel superior to others, but rather to intercede for them as a father or a mother, crying out with the very intercession of Jesus Christ, uh, travailing in prayer for them like Paul did. I said, I'm in, I'm in travail that Christ would be formed within you. Have the heart of a father and a mother, not the one of a critic and a judge, interceding for those who may not be where you are, crying out for the, to God on their behalf, making intercession for them, saying, God, make these people ready, instead of judging them and criticizing them because they are not where you are in Christ. Amen? Let your words for others be filled with grace, seasoned with salt. Even if someone, even if you detect something in someone, there's still a way to say it that's filled with grace and filled with love. Don't be critical and judgmental. Be one who wants to build up and to edify. Be one who wants to speak encouraging words. See, uh, 1 Corinthians 14 says, prophesy, prophesy. The one who prophesies encourages, builds up, and comforts. Nowhere does it say the one who prophesies tears down and criticizes and brings disruption and discomfort. If you're going to speak prophetically to others in their situation, do it to build them up and encourage them and exhort them and comfort them. You Let your words be words of grace seasoned with salt. All right, the last one. The best for last. All right, you probably are like, okay, he's got seven minutes. Okay, hurry up. I don't want to hear it. But this one is very important for the season we're in. Come into divine order under divine authority. Come into divine order under divine authority. Now, I'm just going to say this, that the Lord has been very clear to us as elders over the past two months that through um, four, four uh, dreams, one vision, and one prophetic word, that we are in a season right now, and I, I believe it has to do with the season of the Lord where the authority of Christ is coming to his church in a new way that's never come. And it's very important, the apostolic, true apostolic church, not the stuff we've seen over the past 20 years. You know, the, I'm going to put it on a business card and I'm the apostle of this nation or this mountain, all that nonsense we've seen, which is not the true apostolic. The true apostolic is, you know, when Paul said, us apostles are last of the earth. We are the dregs of society. We are the scum of the nations. We are, you know, that, that's the true apostolic. If you really saw what the true apostolic was, no one in the world would want to be called an apostle. <sighs> But God is raising up the apostles. God is raising up true apostles in the end of the age because God, the authority of Christ is coming. That's Revelation 12.10. There is coming a time before the Lord returns when the authority of Christ comes. And when the authority of Christ comes, not the authority of man built on man-made platforms, not the authority of man built on prestige and prominence and influence and money and networks and charisma and giftings and all these different things. That's not the authority of Christ. That's the authority of man. God's tearing down the authority of man. It's the authority of Christ is coming. And when the authority of Christ is coming, the true apostolic comes into place and God begins to bring his church into divine order. So let me just share this. Just Okay, let me share my testimony about how God brought me into divine order to help you, all right? So I was probably in my late 20s. And when you're in your late, when you're in your 20s, let me say, not everyone's this way. I was this way. You're, the tendency when you're in your 20s is to be like, I know everything. I am, and I, you know, I am the Lord's anointed one. I am the second coming of the Messiah. I have this gifting and this anointing that God has given me. And I'm not saying I was like that, but I am saying I was like that. And... The word of the Lord came to me through two different people in my 20s that your ministry will come out of serving your dad. 
I'm like, oh, really? I'm like, I could do such a better job than him. I don't think that way now at all. But I'm just being honest. Like Now I'm going to his shoulder crying every day, like, oh, what do I do? What do I say? Blah, blah, blah. And he, he does, he's done a way better job than me. I mean, it's a lot harder than you realize, you know, helping to lead a church. But <clears throat> back then in my late 20s, I thought I was God's gift to the body of Christ. I thought I had this great revelation, this great anointing, this great insight that I could lead great. I could be a great speaker, all these different things. And the Lord, the word of the Lord to me was your ministry will come out of serving your dad. <laughs> and it came twice through two different people that didn't know each other um, and had no idea that the Lord had spoken to me about that. One time we were in a Bible school right after we got married and, and I, I've shared the story before where Angie was having a hard time. Just She wanted to stay at her church and I knew God was calling me to this church. I knew God was calling me to serve my dad in ministry. And this man, we were in Bible school, and this man stopped all of a sudden, and he prophesied over me right in mid-sentence. He said, you're, he spoke to me, he said, you're called to serve your dad. And I knew it was the word of the Lord. Angie thought she, he was a false prophet. <laughs> <laughs> he got fired, actually, for saying that word to me because they were trying to bring me to their church to, to be in ministry there. Long story. I won't go into all that. But that was the word of the Lord to me. You are to serve your dad in ministry. And again, I thought being young, I know what to do. I know what we need to do to grow the church. I know what we need to do to, to be who God's called us to be. And I, you know, I, you've heard the story. I wanted to help bring, make our church a little more seeker sensitive and, you know, a little more palatable. So people, you know, unbelievers could come in and not feel like, what are you guys even talking about? All this stuff. And there was this real tension between me and dad um, back then. And Anyway, no, and he had talked to Noel, Noel Mann, who came to our, our church many times over from 96 to 2012 from Australia. He had talked to Noel Mann about that, and, and Noel in the middle of the service, it was in the old building, but kind of where Sue is is where I was sitting. And I remember exactly what I had. I was in my late 20s. I had this army green polo shirt, short sleeve shirt on, and Noel walked up to me, <clears throat> and he took me by the collar, I don't know. Raise your hand if you remember that. I want to see if anyone remembers that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Some were like, yeah, you deserve that. But I, I did deserve it. I, I did. Maybe I would have done it a little different, but I mean, it, it worked. He, he, he took me by the collar and he shook me like this. And while I was standing up and he shook me and he shook me and he said, you are not called to build a secret sensitive church. And I was pretty, I was very offended. I was like, that is so inappropriate to like call me out in the middle of everybody and rebuke me like that. Have you, you know, have you not read Matthew 18 where you, if someone sins against you, you go to him in private and you tell him privately first and then, then you go to the church in public, he's so out of order, blah, 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 blah. And you know, I was fighting and wrestling, but you know, I, I was very offended by that, just to be honest. But I tell you what, it broke something off my life. It broke something off my life, and I'd never had that problem. I didn't say never had that problem, but that shifted. <laughs> You're like, well, maybe not. Maybe that's preacher talk, but it, it shifted something in me from that point on where God began to do a work, and he began to give me a revelation of the importance of divine authority, of the importance of divine order, and that, that's when I began to come into serving my dad in ministry. And through that, here's what I wanted you to see. Through that, I began to realize that my nature, this is what God did. When God brought me into divine authority, what God did is he began to expose in my heart that my nature was more like the nature of the dragon than the nature of the lamb. It was hard. I saw the ugliness of my soul like I've never seen. There, uh, probably the deepest pur purification the Lord has ever brought into my life was the year when God began to teach me about divine authority and divine order. I did not know about divine order and divine authority. I had no idea about it. I had no idea that I was um, called to serve my dad and I was, I was to be in divine order and be in submission to his leadership in, in terms of in ministry. And God began to just, he really made this very clear you, I'm not saying he spoke this, but it was the, 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 the sensing I had or the knowing I had in my spirit. Where when I began to see my rebellion and my independence, and I began to see how I wanted to be the leader, 
because I thought I could do better, which was absolute pride, God began to show me, you have the nature of the dragon. I want to form the nature of the lamb. See, that's one of the narratives of the book of Revelation is this, the end time battle will be about the narrative between who has the nature of the lamb, meek and mild and in submission to divine authority, and who has the nature of the dragon, proud and independent and rebellious and usurping authority. God, help us that we would be like those who have the nature of the lamb formed in us through divine authority. And I remember so clearly, it was so convicting where I forget what even what it was, but I was in disagreement with my dad and I was in my heart complaining about something. And then I saw in the, in the Exodus journey where Moses, the people were grumbling against Moses. They were grumbling against Moses and the Lord spoke to Moses and said, their grumbling Moses is not against you, it's against me. And I realized the Lord was saying to me, your grumbling is not against your dad, Brian. Your grumbling is against me. And I was so convicted and I was so brought under the conviction of the Lord and I realized, God, forgive me for grumbling against you because I was grumbling against dad. Sorry, dad, if I haven't repented. <laughs> yeah, I've long repented since then, but publicly there. <laughs> Yeah, he's grumbled against me too, but he was probably right and I was probably wrong. And I saw that, and God, it seems like for a year, brought me into divine authority slowly, slowly. I'm not going to claim like I jumped right in and like, oh yeah, I'm going to humbly submit. It was a slow process. It was a slow process that God began to work, but I saw, oh Lord, the utter importance of coming into divine authority. And as Revelation 12, 10 talks about, there is coming a day called when the day of the authority of Christ is coming. I believe it's the last three and a half years of this age. The day of the authority of Christ has come. When the day of his authority has come, God's bringing the church into divine order. Now, that's when the true full apostolic comes into fruition. I believe it's rising right now, but it's coming in a greater, greater measure. Okay, I've told on me, so now let me get it to you. <clears throat> in my 25 plus years of being an elder in, a, in this church, is the ones who have the hardest trouble submitting to divine authority and divine order are those who are spiritual and can hear from God. That's the way I was, okay? So, but it's also in 1 Corinthians where Paul said, Paul, Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1437, 1437 through 40. He, had, he specifically said this, bringing divine order into their services. He specifically said, if anyone thinks he is a prophet, in other words, they hear God, or if anyone thinks he's spiritual, in other words, they're in tune with the Holy Spirit, probably some presumptuously thought that, others were truly prophetic and spiritual. Let him recognize this, that the things that I write to you are the Lord's commandment. The apostolic commandment was coming into the Corinthians. And even though there was spiritual and prophetic people there, and they were like, no, that's not from the Lord. That's not from the Lord. I can hear God directly from myself. I don't need you, Paul. Paul's saying, no, I'm coming in apostolic authority. The commandment that I'm bringing into this church is the Lord's commandment to bring divine order into this house because you are the crazy, carnal, fleshly Corinthians. But the point I'm trying to make here is those who were spiritual and those who were uh, prophetic had a hard, that's who Paul pointed out, they had a harder time submitting to the order of God because they could hear from God. They could have this relationship with God. And that's true, we all can have that relationship with God. But there are certain things God reveals to those, the elders of the church who are in government that he doesn't reveal to everyone, and it's important that you hear from God for yourself in your times with Jesus, but you also can hear what God is speaking through those in authority he's given authority to. Does that make sense? <laughs> and I just want to say, okay, I'm not talking about me here, but I'm talking about Dad and Randall, our wives that serve along with us, 
I thank God for the elders that are God has given to govern this church. Church government is never meant to be run by one single man of God. It's meant to be a plurality of leadership. It's meant to be led by the elders. And by the way, let me say this, Randall has just as much governing authority as Dad and I. Sometimes I hear this as always like, well, Ken and Brian. No, it's actually Ken, Brian, and Randall who are the elders. I think sometimes, you know, because Randall is, you know, just kind of laid back and use a Gen Z word, chill, you know, that, that sometimes people don't think of. No, Randall is an elder in this church. He is a man of God that over many years has been tried and tested. He is full of wisdom. He is Christ-like. He is, has just as much governing authority as Dad and I do. And our wives who serve alongside with us. I mean, everyone knows who, met, who has met Angie knows she's not even the better half. She's a better 75 or 80 or 90 percent. And they're like, yes. I see people saying amen. I agree with you. I agree with you. And Anna's like, amen. <sighs> but I just want to say j just how grateful I am that we have a leadership team, and we're, we're far from perfect, but we have a leadership team that is like, we are not in this for any other reason but to hear what is God saying. We have no agenda but the Lamb. I think all the agenda has been burned out, I think, for the most part. I, don't, I feel like I had the agenda prior, but God's dealt with that. Is we, as a leadership team, is like, what are you saying? What are you doing? We have no agenda. We want to do what you're saying, and we want to be under your headship and your leadership, and we want to govern this church the way you want us to govern. And we've got men and women of God of, of tested character, of integrity, that, uh, that, uh, that hear the Lord very clearly. And so I just, I just want to say that, that when the Lord gives guidelines or the Lord gives you know, instructions about how to flow in divine order, I'm, I'm not going to say 100% you know, that we're not, you know, I'm not saying we're infallible, but I'm saying I feel pretty confident when we get together and we pray over a certain period of time and this, these things come out, this is the Lord's command. This is what the Lord is saying. Um, and so, John Bevere, I want to read a quote from John Bevere in his book, The Fear of the Lord. I'm not sure if we have the slide or not, but okay, we don't. But in, in John Bevere's book, The Fear of the Lord, I just want to, I, I believe this is very timely for where we are right now, um, not only in this church, but around the church and what God's doing, is before God manifests his glory, listen, before God manifests his glory, there must be divine order. Once his, this is very important, once his glory is revealed, there is great blessing, but also once his glory is revealed, any irreverence, disorder, or disobedience is met with immediate judgment. That's, you know, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. I think we're moving into that time. But the importance of, of having that right balance of what Scripture calls us to. Now, let me just say this, just in context. The timing of me saying that is probably the worst timing because right now we're seeing right now clergy abuse. Like God's really exposing clergy spiritual abuse right now like never before. And just to see how leaders in positions of authority and power have manipulated that with prophecy to gain things for themselves and riches and wealth and all these different things is, is God is exposing that right now. Yet it's interesting that Jude in the book of Jude in one sentence dealt with abusive authority and rebellion to authority in one statement. He said they've gone the way of Balaam, which was, an was a spiritual leader who abused his power, manipulating the prophetic for his own selfish purposes. And then in the very next statement, he says, and they've gone the way of Korah, which was rebellion to authority. So you see the balance there. There's balance in this. I just want to make sure you know there's balance in this. You are not to submit to anyone in authority that is an abusive leader, all right? Okay, I'm gonna, that, that's an entirely different subject that I hope to go into in the future because I think God's highlighting that. And, 
you know, when, when the ones, like the elders who were called to govern the church, listen, you would not want to be an elder. Our judgment seat experience is going to be way more severe than yours. That's what Scripture says. If we are going to give an account at the judgment seat of Christ. Leaders are going to have a much more severe judgment. Teachers and elders are going to have a much more severe judgment at the judgment seat of Christ because God has entrusted uh, measures of influence to us. It should put the fear of the Lord in us. And the Lord said in Matthew 18 that if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, this is so sobering. If you cause one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better for you not to have even been born, but for a millstone to be tied around your neck and for you to be thrown down into the sea. You want to be a leader? <laughs> and you've got responsibility and God's judgment for the influence you have to make sure that you are stewarding things in the fear of the Lord? That's a, that's a fearful, terrifying thing that God help us to live in the fear of the Lord. So if you think that's a challenge for you to come under divine authority, I, I promise you, it's way more challenging to be in leadership to realize my judgment, dad's judgment, Randall's judgment, our wives, our judgment at the judgment seat of Christ is going to be more strict, more severe, especially as teachers, because we're influencing God's people. So yes, there is a need to correct spiritual abuse. God's doing that right now. And there's also the need to correct rebellion to authority. As I'm watching on social media the response to the uh, clergy abuse that's being exposed and the, going to the opposite end of the spectrum to saying, well, we don't need any authority. We're throwing it all out because they're all, you know, these terrible, wicked people. That other end of the spectrum, and I'm just saying, God, help us. Bring us into that balance that we would bring, you would bring a purification in the leadership of your church so we would not abuse our authority or use our platform or our position to manipulate and get what we want. And also, Lord, help those who have been hurt by those in leadership not to go up the deep end into the rebellion of Korah and say, well, we can hear from God directly and we don't need the leadership you've given us. I just want to say the, the, the fate of Korah and those who followed in him was not well, not, did not go well. The earth split open and, and, and brought them into wherever that was. It was hell or, I don't know, hell or probably hell. God is wanting to bring the church into divine order. What I've found is the more we come into divine order, the more we can actually hear God as he targets our independence. See, God is wanting to target our independence and our dependence to bring us into an interdependence upon him and his body. And so as we come into divine order, everything comes into balance. Everything comes into fruitfulness. Everything comes into, into blessing where God's glory can then just flow. God has not changed. God has always worked through leadership from Genesis to Revelation. And, it, you know, that, that's where the, the standard is set for us in leadership, for us and elders, is like, God, help us. And I, I, feel like, I feel like we're very much like, Lord, what are you saying? What are you doing? Praying through every little thing. Yeah, but we're not perfect. But God wants to bring us, God wants to get at our independence to think, well, I can bypass the leadership of the church and do my own thing and do this thing uh, independently of the leadership. God wants to bring us into divine order. There comes fruit in divine order. Fruit in divine order. There comes blessing in divine order. There comes the move of the Spirit in divine order. And, and you know, after... What God did with me in that year long of, of exposing me and laying out who I was and the, the, the wickedness in my own heart, I was like, God, I don't really want authority anymore. I don't, you know, it's like, then he's like, oh, yeah, I can entrust you now. I can trust you with authority now because you're, you're not using it for your selfish purposes. You're using it to do what I want to do. Okay, is there anyone else I haven't hit yet? I think I got everyone. Oh, wait, no. Um, just in conclusion, in conclusion, you prayed for this. In conclusion, God is purifying his church. 
we live, I, even, though it's, even though some things are hard, we live still in the greatest hour of human history right now. I mean, I wholeheartedly believe that we are living in the days leading up to the second coming of Christ. And he is not going to have a church that is just running away from the Antichrist, defeated, overcome. The Lord is going to have an overcoming church. The Lord is going to have a glorious church. The Lord is going to have a church, a, a, and it's probably going to be a remnant, but a remnant that shines forth the glory of God from the inside out, who radiates Christ outwardly, who has become possessed of him, filled with him. Christ has possessed them. And so to do that, God is raising up, God is bringing the church, I should say, into the fire of his dealings to bring up impurity so that we can walk in holiness and impurity with him. And so in closing, if you ever call me Pastor Brian, you'll be uh, kicked out of the church. No, I'm kidding. So you don't call me Pastor Brian. In closing, let God do a work of pruning in you to bear more fruit as he does a work. I'm laughing. I think Anna and Ellie are making fun of me in the back. <clears throat> I did the very same thing. <clears throat> I did the very, hey, I'm reaping what I sowed. I did the very same thing. Me and John Barnett used to remote control our dads. His dad was a senior pastor and mom was an associate. We would be in, sit in the balcony and remote control our dads when they preached. And we were like, okay, blink, 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 or the joystick. Back then, we didn't have the fancy stuff now. I've reaped what I've sowed. Okay, I'm glad, I'm glad, you're, I'm glad you got something out of church today, Anna and Ellie. That's awesome. <clears throat> okay. So let me just, let me just uh, pray there and we'll end there. Um, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, for the, the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the, the fire of the Lord. Lord, I pray that you would baptize our hearts in fire. Lord, baptize our hearts in your fire, Lord. Purify us. Lord, raise up impurities. Lord, raise up, God, dross. Lord, raise up different things, God, you want to raise up. Lord, raise it up that we might be pure and clean and holy. Just say, Lord, do that work in me. Remember what Larry said, don't, that was the word of the Lord. Don't run from the fire. God wants to bring his fire. Don't run from the fire. We just say, Lord, do that work in us, Lord. Do that work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we'll end the online part here.